for uh, this first in a series of webinars. Uh, my name is Mike Delinsky. I'll be uh, hosting this for the next uh, almost couple of months. This will run every two weeks. Uh, just to give you a little background myself, I, I was with Alberta Agriculture for a number of years and then worked for, for Agritrend and then joined Taurus three years ago. Um, my love is in plants. I was trained as an entomologist, but uh, I've sort of recreated myself in retirement. So uh, I just want to chat uh, for a second about the way I'm approaching this because it's going to be a little bit different. And my philosophy is that if we understand how the plant grows, we can make better decisions about how we manage them and how we understand them. So uh, I'm speaking more in terms of a lot of principles. I use a lot of photographs that I've taken. So every photograph you see is one I took. Uh, I use a lot of line drawings to, to represent uh, the principles. Uh, I tie in nutrients uh, as I go through the physiology of the plant. And uh, I have four in this series. And I'm hoping you can take in all four because uh, they sort of build on each other. And if you miss the first one, uh, I can't go back and, and redo the first one so that you can understand the second and the third and, and, and the fourth one. So if you miss it, you can go back. These will be posted and you can go back and, and review them. And in fact, uh, as you move from, from this one, you should probably review it just before we do the second one so that you, you can sort of get up to speed on it because you, you forget very quickly. And I'll be talking about uh, in this particular webinar today, uh, the basics of, of the cell, the basics also of some of the things I see going on in agriculture that I, I sometimes think people maybe don't recognize or don't want to recognize. Uh, I'll talk about the cell because uh, everything is about the cell. If you don't understand what goes on in the cell and how a cell performs and what the organelles in the cell do and what the nutrients do and the value of those nutrients, you're sort of stuck uh, because nobody else is kind of teaching this type of stuff. If I was doing this live, I'd be asking a lot of questions and having interaction. But since uh, that isn't possible, I'll just be going through and, uh, and giving you the answers to some of the questions I typically ask. And then I'll talk about photosynthesis and respiration. Now, for some of you who haven't been at university for a long time, or maybe have never been there, and uh, you, you might not really get a grip on, on some of the early stuff in the cells and some of the things that go on in the cell. Uh, so let me just assure you that you'll never see any of this. You just have to believe that it's going on and know that the genetics of the plant is, is doing everything it can under all circumstances. Uh, so that's the part of the cell. Now the photosynthesis, it's the, it's the most important process on earth and respiration is another one. The second part will be all about roots and water uptake. The third one will be on stress management, mycorrhizae and rhizobium. I have to sort of do two in one there. And the fourth one, which may be the most important for some of you, I'll go through the life cycle of a plant, of one of our crops. I use canola, peas, um, and um, wheat. You know, a legume, uh, a monocot, a cereal, and a crucifer, canola. And I'll use those as a model of what happens throughout the life cycle of, of plants uh, so you can be ready for springtime. I, I hope you all made it through COVID and I do use COVID a little bit in my presentation so uh, let's get going. We've come a long way since these days but you know we've got a long way to go because our yields have doubled and tripled but we've been mining the soil pretty badly for a number of years. You know we've been farming this land here in western Canada and I'm going to focus on western Canada for, for this audience. Uh, for you know, a little over 100 years, and we haven't been putting a whole lot back. You know, and we'll talk about that um, you know, as we go on. But let me, let me start here with an overview of a plant. And you know, here's your typical plant. You know, we, we have a plant that lives with the shoot above the ground and the roots below the ground. And we have the plant taking in nutrients here through the root, moving it up through the xylem into the leaves, it runs it through photosynthesis here with water and it produces sugar and it gives out oxygen and it takes in CO2. That's it. That's a plant. Photosynthesis produces sugar, which is carbon for making all the molecules that basically a plant makes in terms of 
uh, proteins, enzymes, and enzymes are proteins, all the hormones are proteins. So the plants are running on proteins. And we'll talk about the sourcing concept uh, later on. But the important thing to remember is that carbon dioxide, water, oxygen, nutrients, and sunlight are the only inputs that the plant has to make everything. Make everything. The CO2 is the carbon, the water, well, what can we do about water? We can do something about water and I'll talk. We can't do much about CO2 levels. We can't do much about oxygen levels. We can't do much about sunshine, although we know, like last year, the sunshine was bright and it was dry, and that's not good. And we know in the years we had lots of smoke and the skies were cloudy, the sunshine was inhibited and that wasn't good. So we can't change that. So what can we manage as farmers? Well, we can manage water to a degree. We can measure where it runs to. We can irrigate if we're lucky enough to have irrigation if it's dry. We can influence penetration by reducing compaction so water can penetrate the soil. We can plant deep-rooted plants to make channels for water to go down. We can prevent it from running downhill, which then leads to salinity where we get accumulation of salts. But you know, there, there's a limit. We can also manage how we capture snow and so on in the prairies. So in the end, what it comes down to for farmers and retails that supply farmers with their nutrients and their products, and we'll be focusing on nutrients. I don't talk about herbicides or insecticides. We got a pretty good handle on, on controlling uh, you know, uh, biotic uh, threats. So really what we're left with is nutrients. And this all focuses basically on nutrients and the role of nutrients in the plant and how the plant handles that and water and how it controls both of those. So that's what this is all about. And it's controlled by this thing called transpiration, the flow of water from the roots to the leaves and then leaving through the stomata. And I'll cover this in detail in the second part, which is talking about water in the second, second webinar. But that pull and that release of water puts suction on the roots, which keeps the flow moving, and that cycles everything through that plant. And it's key, as we will learn under a stress in the third section. And we also know today that <clears throat> the whole system for growing plants is related to microbes interacting with soil and plants interacting with both of those in a physical, chemical, and biological way. And the interactions back and forth. For, for example, I'm a believer that plants control the microbes in the rhizosphere right around the root. By the exudates, they put out the sugars to feed those microbes. As those microbes feed on organic matter, they release nutrients, and that cycle goes on. The organic matter is, is really the source of a lot of nutrients. And the top foot of soil is really the source of almost all the nutrients in the plant, except for those that can be leached. Now, I just throw this in here because we're always talking about plant health. And this is a good way for you guys that have, you know, Stanfield cotton underwear, shorts. Just take a pair of those, dig it a hole in the field and shove it in the ground in the springtime, come back in the fall, and take a look what's left. You want to measure or, uh, you know, soil health, yeah, just use your underwear. Don't use those synthetic ones, the bugs don't like them. And if they look like this, well, man, you've got some real healthy stuff. If they're sort of like this, it's not so good. If they still look like that, well, your soil health isn't that great. The other thing I wanna, you know, introduce you to, uh, which is a great soil health tool, is the shovel. If I go to a field day, you know, and I never take a shovel with me, please let me know and, and tell me to go home. Because if I don't take a shovel with me and look at the roots, I'm not helping you at all and you're not helping yourself. Take a shovel, dig up the roots. The roots are the key. Plants were made to feed from roots. They weren't made to feed in their leaves. They get sun in their leaves, but they get their nutrients and water from the roots. Okay, take a shovel, dig it in. You'll find out where your compaction layers are. You'll, show, you'll see how the roots are growing in line with your seed furrows. Trust me, wear it out. I wanna take just a minute in the beginning 
to talk about this. We just come through COVID or we're coming through COVID and some of you will be familiar with the fact that if we want to deal with COVID or prevent COVID, you take vitamin D3, you take a lot of zinc, you take cysteine, acetyl, uh, uh, N-acetyl uh, cysteine, and we'll talk about all those when we get into uh, the stress management because plants deal with stress almost the same way that humans do. But plants have a lot of benefits. Let me show you something here. I work with a, a, a well, I've, I shouldn't say work. I've, I've dealt with a lady uh, who's a retired psychologist at the University of Calgary, and she's really interested in the role of micronutrients and nutrients in mental health. I just want to point out something. She uh, sent me some of her slides. Take a look at this, the pathway to serotonin, which is involved in, in brain chemistry. And look at what's involved. Iron, vitamin B6, copper, iron again, vitamin B6, vitamin B6 key, tryptophan. Now, why is tryptophan interesting? Well, tryptophan is what's called an aromatic amino acid. And you're familiar with a product called Roundup or glyphosinate. Uh, well, the way glyphosinate affects plants is it interferes with the building of these aromatic amino acids, including tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine. And that's why when you, when, uh, you spray a plant, it interferes with the production of those. Humans cannot produce tryptophan. We have no ability to do that. Plants do, and, and we eat plants or we eat animals that eat plants. And we have to get this. It's an essential amino acid which interferes or affects brain chemistry, along with things like molybdenum, which I missed. So anyhow, uh, that's just an, an interesting thing. And, and because humans don't um, produce those amino acids, uh, we don't have the enzyme that's required. And therefore, when glyphosate was, was registered, it interfered with one specific enzyme that blocks the shikimate pathway and it wasn't considered to be hazardous to us. But it, if we don't get it, it affects our mental stability. So, you know, and doctors have given very little credence to this aspect of mental health and other health. I mean, zinc is key to all enzymes, but let's take a look at what's happening in the soil and in the plants. This is from Britain. It's hard to find this kind of stuff. And this is uh, from 1947, the year I was born, to 1997, or year 50 years. Look what's happened to levels. And look at copper. You know, we've done a pretty good job in potassium, phosphorus. You know, well, iron is down, but not bad calcium. This is U.S. data on wheat from 1963 to 2003. Calcium's down, magnesium, everything is down, including selenium. There's one amino acid that we have called selenocysteine, which requires selenium and is being implicated in terms of possibly reducing risk of cancer. So I just point this out because actually the plants equate to soil health because they feed those organisms and they equate to human health because we, they feed us. But let's take a look here quickly to set the background for what I'm going to be talking about. This is a, a soil and tissue analysis from ENL Labs, a summary of their 2020 data. I haven't received the 2021. So take a look at this. Soil sample, 66% low in phosphorus, 78% low in sulfur, 37% low in boron, and 55% of samples low in zinc. Remember that, 55% low in zinc. Tissue tests, 39% of tissue samples uh, tests show low in boron, sort of matching what the soil tests are showing. We can argue about whether the analysis is appropriate, but it's a good signal. Eastern Canada, low in phosphorus, low in sulfur, low in boron, phosphorus, sulfur, boron. Notice this, sulfur. Not too many years ago, we had acid rain in uh, Ontario, the whole Eastern seaboard, it's gone. We are now putting down sulfur everywhere because we've cleaned up our stacks, but the same deficiencies. So what's happening? And I use canola because I'm, I'm from the West here. And when I came to Alberta in 72, we were growing you know, hardly any canola. Our yield was 17, 18 
bushels per acre growing that old wrapper. And today we're growing 22, 20, and we'll use 20. Let's look at 20,000 acres. That's 700,000 pounds of P2O5 per year, 301 tons. And that equates to, when you convert it to just phosphorus, 150,000 tons of phosphorus a year leaves the prairies. That's just canola. If we take a look at our crops and we look at, I use 100 bushels here to calculate this based on uptakes and removal. Um, you know, if you grow 50 bushels, you just use, you know, 50% of it, 60, whatever. But this is what we're removing in, a, in basically uh, 100 bushels. Uh, 300 pounds of, of, of product. Look at canola, 922 pounds of macros and 6.6 .6 pounds of micros. Peas, how much we're removing? Only two pounds of micros, wheat. But we've been doing that for not at those levels, but now we're doing pulling harder than we ever pulled. We've been doing that for a while. We got some issues that are coming. And where do we send it? We either send it to the livestock feedlot or to the urban feedlot. So we're taking all this massive amount and concentrating in urban centers because that's where the people are. And that's where we get crystal green, not to promote tourist products, but we get it from the urban feedlot. So we're doing that and we're not putting much back. We're not putting the amount of phosphorus back. We're not putting the micros back in any degree in a large sense. So it's something for you young guys to look forward to in the future. Let me just go through what we did, uh, or I did with 2020 seed labs on the 2020 wheat crop. We took 100 samples that they had gotten for germination of vigor tests, and we sent it to ENL and we had them do an analysis. And what did we find? 100% of the sample showed deficiency in boron and 54% deficiency in zinc in the seed, of wheat seed, random, randomly taken, no history of the fertility. So that 54% matches exactly what ANL said for Western Canada, 55% of, of soil samples showed deficiency in zinc. This is Alberta, I didn't expect this. I expected this in the brown soil zones of Southern Saskatchewan, where they're growing Durham, and Durham is not a very good scavenger of zinc. And, you know, it's not got a lot of organic matter in some cases. So we got some issues we better start dealing with if we wanna sort of reduce that yield deficiency gap that we talk about. And when we talk about yield efficiency, we got all of these factors going on all the time with bugs and disease and wind and nutrient deficiencies and aeration and you name it that are affecting yield. I can tell you one thing, the plant is doing its best to deal with that. And we saw this this uh, past summer. We saw what heat does, what water loss does, but we also saw what the plant does by morning. You see this in the evening, by morning it's perked right up. That has to do with water and we'll talk about that. The plant knows what to do. We got variability across the field. Precision agriculture is the way of the future. If you're not there, get with it because we got to try and level out some of this variability. Compaction, bulk density is increasing as we compact it. And as we move, as we increase bulk density, we reduce the roots ability to access nutrients and we reduce the ability for water to percolate down and saturate or move, infiltrate water into the brooding zone down deeper. And when it gets hot and dry, the plants have to go down for water. And I'll talk about roots uh, big time in the next session. Let's talk about some of the other issues. Organic matter, well, that's depleting. Phosphorus, we see this as we go down, Below about two inches, phosphorus levels drop because phosphorus doesn't move, doesn't move with water worth the darn. Potassium doesn't move much with water. You can see what happens there. Zinc doesn't move with water, it's a metal. Manganese doesn't move with water, it's a metal. So as the heat of summer comes on and the roots go down, they're going into a desert of nutrients unless you can move it down there. The anions can move down, the nitrate can move down, the chloride can move down, the sulfate can move down. Those will move with water, 
but not these. Here's an example from a fellow I work with here at Camrose, and I just summarized what we found. Uh, I did this, uh, we were, I was looking at boron levels of, you know, five pounds of boron per acre broadcast and canola. So this was what we found. Changed his whole life, one sample. And the tissue that went with it, which I won't get into. But organic matter, you can see it drops radically. Phosphorus drops radically, uh, zero to six inches. Uh, phosphorus, potassium crashes. Magnesium is pretty level. Calcium is not too bad. pH, look at the pH range, six to seven. One, one percent or one pH range is not a percentage. One percent, percent range. Cation exchange is not so you know, critical. That's, that's based on the soil qualities and so on. But look at zinc. Bang, done. Manganese, done. Exactly what the rest of those maps that Elston Solberg put together back in 2014. We are getting stratification of these nutrients and it's going to be hurting us long term uh, and it's affecting your productivity. pH is the same thing. I won't spend a lot of time on it because everybody talks about pH, but we know the pH as it drops below about five for sure. But even at 5.7, we're getting loss of ef uh, efficacy of uh, productivity. And we, the other key thing for you guys is to notice is that most of our major nutrients do very well right here in this middle zone around six and a half to 7.3 or four. As we move into higher pH soils, we reduce uptake in some of these, not so much sulfur, not so much potassium, but most of our micronutrients except for molybdenum. Molly is reduced at low pH, which affects a lot of Alberta soils. But as we, we get into lower pHs, almost all of these affect us. Here in Alberta, where we do have a lot of acid soils and it's gonna only go one way and that's get worse unless we lime. I don't think we have to reinvent the wheel. Everybody in the world limes because just growing plants and fertilizing uh, increases acidity. At the top end of it, if we keep putting down the fertilizers we do eventually, those, if they haven't got high uh, limestone levels, will also uh, decrease and become more acid at time. I've talked to some guys in Saskatchewan who are fairly young coaches who have already in their career seen drops in pHs in Saskatchewan, which has uh, relatively high pHs. So no more. And now our task, as farmers, is to grow this plant, grow all the leaves, all the anthers, the stamens, the ovules, the leaves, up to here, up to pollination time. Because at that point in time, the plant changes its life cycle, the hormones increase, and I'll talk about that more in the last stage of this. And here's <clears throat> where we're gonna soon get into uh, the real jux of this presentation. If you look at this field, you see these plants, every one of them genetically is basically the same. Every one of them. When you look at this field, you can see that the field looks great. This is the field in Saskatchewan. This is Phil Thomas from years ago. The plants up on this hilltop are, have less water, probably less nutrients than these here. Every plant, even a few inches apart from each other, is living in a different environment in the soil and experiencing a different environment in a shoot. And every plant is up and down regulating genes to deal with all of those experiences it is facing, just like our human body does without us even knowing it. It just does it based on signaling to its genetics. And the plant has only one objective, to produce seed. It wants its progeny to be healthy, to move forward. Let me propose something to you, as I did with the wheat sample. If you wanna know what nutrients you're short of, we gotta test the seed. If we test the soil, test tissues during the summer to see what's moving, and we've got a new lab in, in, in Red Deer that te does uh, sap testing, and then test the seed over a number of years, we will really get a good handle on what nutrients are in the plant and which ones aren't in the plant in my estimation. 
So now we're gonna spend some time on how does the plant do this? Well, it's based on genes. So we have a, a signal and I'll get into the details of the signal that goes to the DNA, which produces a messenger RNA, which brings about a translation and, and produces a protein in the ribosomes, just like the S protein uh, in the uh, micro, uh, the micro R messenger RNA that is used for COVID. And we get some proteins developed or we get a change in something in the structure and we get uh, a response and then we degrade that protein. So what can we do? This is just used for fossils. We can, the primary root can we grow it longer, we can change the angle. Lateral roots, the hormones and the genetic changes can bring about length, numbers, density, angle and diameter. For example, when a root hits a compaction zone going down, what does it do? It doesn't give up, it'll either grow sideways or it'll grow a thicker root so that it can try and penetrate. And root hairs, you can grow more of them or you can grow the length of them. Now you say, well, what the heck's the difference in the length? How, come I, how much more can we grow a root hair? Well, if you're trying to access as a plant phosphorus, for example, which doesn't move, and it's got a very you know, quick um, decrease in, in concentration, a tiny amount of length increase on thousands of root hairs does make a difference. That's how the plant does it. And the plant is doing this just like any system to maintain equilibrium or homeostasis in its cells. And in plants, when the plant is exposed to excess toxins or nutrients that it can't use, it stores it in the vacuole. And I'll get to that vacuole, but you know, I'm leading up to this. And consider a vacuole bowl the same as your fat cells. Uh, we're born with as many fat cells as we're gonna have, and we replace them, and maybe as we grow, we increase them, but you know, we, we, we produce them. When you become an adult, the only thing that happens, the fat cells either get bigger or smaller. You can't get rid of them unless you do liposuction. So the same thing happens with the vacuole. When you get excess, it's stored in the vacuole. And then as time goes on and the, and the plant needs it, the vacuole gives it back. And I'll show you how that happens. And then we got, uh, you know, different mineral nutrients have to be mobilized in individual cells and organisms or plants. And, you know, they've developed a range of systems to deal with that. And here's what we have to work with, folks. This is it. The essential nutrients for plant growth. And take a look at it. I use this all the time because it bears repeating and we forget as, as adults and we forget, you know, even when we walked out of the university, we forgot what we learned the day after we walked out in many cases. The plant is made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Let's face it, it's 96% about the same as us, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. It is then followed by nitrogen, potassium, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, and sulfur. Uh, that surprises people. Most people say, well, it's N and then it's P. And, you know, they don't see that calcium is really that big a deal in there. Da, 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 da. And what have we been putting back? N, P, K, and now a lot of S. Well, that's, that's good. We're, we're fixing that problem. These metals here are called transitional metals. These are used for uh, all kinds of reactive processes and catalysts in plants. Iron, manganese, zinc copper, molybdenum, and nickel. And they're used in oxidation reduction because they can vary their valence. So they speed up all kinds of reactions. They're key. Boron is used uh, quite heavily, but boron is a tough one because boron is not a metal. It's called a metalloid and it can behave based on pH as a metal or a non-metal. And maybe that's the problem we have in, in boron is basically understanding uh, how the pH is affecting it on a, on a more refined basis. So these are what are going to be used. And I'll talk about all of these as we move through the various things that happen. So now we're gonna move on to the cell. Well, he who builds the most cells wins the race. It's all about the cell. So we have two kinds of basic cells. We have what are called tip growth cells and there are two of them in plants. One is the, and I'll leave that question for you. It's the root hair, the other one, is the pollen tube, and I'll show you some of that. The rest of the, the uh, cells are basically diffuse growth. In other words, they're confined 
uh, genetically by the structure. So if you want to grow upright, you've got to have cells that are going to grow longitudinally in a vertical direction. In the beginning, plants couldn't grow upwards because they didn't have lignans, so they were all looking like lichens, but eventually they figured out how to grow lignans. So there are basically two kinds of, of cells, and they vary. Um, you know, the, you know, the, the um, uh, pollen tube is, of course, in, in, um, in the flora, flor, flower to pollinate the ovule, and the root tip is in the root. So there, there are cells all over the place, and there are some specialized ones, but they basically grow like that. Cell wall is made up largely of, of calcium tied together with some boron, and it's got all these pectins in them, which, you know, and cellulose is the, is the biggest uh, carbohydrate in plants. And that cellulose and these pectin stri uh, uh, strands that run through it give it strength, give it strength. And calcium is also key in the vacuole because calcium is a signaling agent. The biggest use of calcium is in the cell wall structure and as a signaling agent when the plant is uh, under attack or stressed in any way, there's almost always a, a calcium spike from the vacuole. It's very tightly controlled in the plant and calcium is really key. Uh, as uh, somebody said, um, calcium is like oil in your engine. Without it, it stops. So that's why the plant uses more than many people think. Now here are some cells, and here's here's uh, just here are some cells in 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 the in the shoot, and here are some cells in the uh, coleoptile that's just expanding. So you can see they're growing lengthwise because the plant wants to grow up. So how does the plant respond? <clears throat> Well, to, to bring about these changes in terms of roots or proteins, well, it has a receptor in the, in the plasma membrane, and I'll talk about that. And it's just a simple process. It has a receptor. It responds to the, uh, uh, to the, uh, to, uh, to the stimulus, which is hormonal or uh, environmental. You get a secondary messenger, which activates a whole bunch of responses and stimulates the, the uh, the nucleus to do something, and that's all it is. But let's take a look at a cell, because if you don't know, you know, what parts, if you don't know your gut from your heart, you know, how can you figure out how the system works? Same thing with a plant, and for you guys that are, took a basic biology degree, or if you've got kids in grade 12, ask them, they'll know all this kind of stuff if you don't. But uh, let's take a look at it. So there's the vacuole, and the vacuole is this big, that cell, as I said with you, and it can get expands to fill up almost the entire space if there's the excess water and nutrients, like when a seedling gets hits a sideband and gets overloaded, it stores that in the vacuole. And then as the vacuole gives it up and gives it up, eventually gets empty, and then you see a, a deficiency. So that's key. We have the nucleus, which contains all the genetics. We have here the mitochondria, which produces ATP for energy in the cell, in, in the Krebs cycle and respiration. And I, I won't spend a lot of time on it. And here are the chloroplasts where photosynthesis takes place. Uh, here are the ribosomes, which uh, the messenger RNA goes to, just like in COVID, the messenger RNA goes to the ribosomes to produce the spike protein, while the ribosomes produce uh, all the proteins in the plant. And uh, what else we got here? Uh, we got the gold eye we want, and we got peroxisomes, which are important when we get into stress because this is where the plant can take things and destroy them and break them down and kick them out. And then we got the endoplasmic reticulum here, which is like a big highway around in the system, and I'll show you better ones later. And one thing of importance that uh, we only found out about 25 or so years ago is that there are little portals between cells called plasmodesmata. And when we look at that, we look at that cell, we have all these nutrients working there, phosphorus, manganese, molybdenum, and very zinc, in various processes. And it is that combination and the only things we can influence that makes the whole thing work. Now, some of you are saying, oh man, this guy's getting deep, 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 deep. You know, and some people accuse me of confusing people. Well, you know, some things are not easy to explain. And like I said in the beginning, you don't have to understand this. There's no test, and uh, but you have to know this is going on. So here's the plasma. All right, let me go back here a bit. Uh, one more. I forgot to mention this, the plasma membrane. This is key. 
right here, this little film of membrane around here, because the cell wall keeps it solid, and then the plasma membrane is uh, the membrane that allows things in and out. So if you wanna have control of your cell, you have to be able to control what comes in and what goes out. So here's the plasma membrane. All these blue dots are phosphorus. That's why it's key. Phosphorus is key to making the cells for the, both the DNA and the plasma membranes. And this is fat. So it allows, and these are all sensors, little antenna. And these are transporter ports where the plant can, all, can control what's going in and out. So let's see what the plant does. So here's your plasma membrane. You can see it allows CO2, nitrogen, and oxygen. It's permeable to that. It allows some ethylene through alcohols. It allows urea and water through. Slightly permeable. Well, urea goes through because it's it's got no charge, so it moves very quickly. But look at this. That will allow glucose or fructose through sugars. That will allow any of these cations through. Doesn't allow ATP, nucleic acids. Doesn't allow any of those through. It controls everything going in by putting transporters in this plasma membrane to allow it. And here's where we go. Take a look at this. <clears throat> you can see in this route, there's a, a nitrate transporter, an ammonium transporter, transporter, sulfate transporter in the roots right here, all over. So, and here we see the plasma membrane again. It has these transporters too that have different affinities. This is called a HATS, high affinity transporter. So if it's hard to get something, it upregulates that. If there's lots of it, it's got a low affinity transporter, so it makes it easy, sort of facilitated diffusion. If the plant has to get some nutrients off a soil particle, it puts in transporters that put out carboxylates and phosphatases to kick off nutrients. And then it has other uh, genetic changes that allow it to be pumped in. And it uses ATP in some cases to pump it against uh, a differential. So the plant can do those kinds of things. That's why it reduces the pH around its root by pumping out these hydrogens, which will then kick off the uh, cations here. And it even has these portals to control water. The water is controlled by these aquaporons, which can be shut and open to allow water to move. All this is going on in the plant all the time. I think this is my last one, so you'll, you'll survive this. So here's the plasma membrane, and you can see all these transporters, metals, nitrate, phosphate, potassium, sugars, amino acids. It's putting them in and out. Here's the vacuole, and you can see it has transporters in and out, in and out. Calcium, cadmium, magnesium, sugar, sodium. So it's moving things back and forth based on energy. And how does it do this? Well, jeepers creepers. The nucleus contains the DNA, and on the DNA is genes, and genes are a pattern for making a protein. So when the plant needs something, it goes to the nucleus, makes a messenger RNA, makes a copy of the gene that it needs, takes it down into the endoplasmic reticulum, just like the spike protein for COVID, to the ribosomes, and then it's got all kinds of things to bring the amino acids, line them up, and the ribosomes make the protein. And they all make them starting with methionine, which is a sulfur amino acid. It's called the start codon for it. And all proteins, including the spike protein, start with methionine. And then there's our, our stop proteins, because it's got to quit making. Takes them, puts them into the endoplasmic reticulum and puts them into the plasma membrane and make some work. And you can see here, the mitochondria is hooked to the endoplasmic reticulum. The chloroplasts are hooked to the endoplasmic reticulum. So this system of endoplasmic reticulum can carry nutrients and amino acids to where it's needed. But watch this. And here's how oil is made, right here, oil body. So things like canola are made here in the endoplasmic reticulum based on the genetics and the proteins that are used to make the oil, okay? 
we also notice that this can move to the next cell. So this highway can take what are called microRNA and they can move nutrients and all kinds of hormones from cell to cell so that they can mount a common response or can move nutrients effectively from these organs, organelles to these. So the plant acts as one big monster. So that's how the cell works. And I'll make a reference throughout the rest of my presentations, but now we're gonna wind down by looking at photosynthesis and respiration. I hope that didn't confuse you too much. You just have to know that the genes are there. Uh, the plants have in excess of our human genes. The human being has about 28,000 genes, a simple plant. You know, like barley or canola, wheat has 105,000 genes. It's a huge genome in wheat. Canola, probably 50,000 genes. So plants are much more complicated, but you have to understand that they have uh, epigenetic history and uh, evolutionary history that has got them to this place. They have experience, they know how to do this. Uh, we just need to help them to reduce that yield gap. But photosynthesis, we do produce sugars, which is then used in respiration, the Krebs cycle to make energy. It's used as a base for making nucleic acids. It may use to make synthesize all proteins, make all starches, and it's run by transpiration and then translocation. So I'll look at translocation in the next one, but let's take a look at photosynthesis. Simple process. Water and CO2 are combined to produce sugar, and OT is the product byproduct. Carbon dioxide in, water pulls water in, moves sugar out. We get CO2 or O2 oxygen given out as a byproduct, which allows life on Earth, both from ocean plants and land plants, and sun drives it. And of that energy that is hitting the leaves, a very small percent of it actually is made in the end. Only about 5% of that is producing that sugar. There's a lot used uh, in, in terms of uh, respiration, the plant to deal with heat, to deal with metabolism and so on. So I just put this out because it's kind of a cool thing, uh, Rubisco something you may or may not have heard of, maybe at the university, about this ribulose biphosphate carboxylase oxidase, which means that carboxylase, it means it can take up carbon, CO2, and oxygen remains, it can use oxygen. It's the most abundant protein on earth. Hmm. If you haven't heard of it, well, uh, it's kind of interesting because every plant, every plant virtually uses rubisco to take in CO2 into the plant. I think I'll use two, two, two structures here to show uh, uh, how this works. So we have uh, water coming in, it's the first thing that has to happen, and light coming in into the chloroplast, and these are called thylakoids, we won't get into that right now. So the first part of it is to produce some ATP, which is energy, and this thing called NADPH, which is some hydrogen, which is used in the second part of photosynthesis, which takes in CO2, runs it through the Calvin Benson cycle and produces sugar. That's it, it's just that simple to a degree. And then notice that this ATP is used here and then it becomes ADP, which is short one phosphorus and the NADP without the hydrogen. So this cycle, so the, this light energy captures, makes ATP and it's used here, it's broken down, it cycles back and it's re-energized and, and ATP is produced again and it cycles around and around and around. Don't get too worried about this, you don't have to know the, uh, ever see this again if you don't want to. But here's where Rubisco comes in, in the second phase. So this Rubisco, contains magnesium as well, a whole pile of nitrogen. It is the major source of nitrogen in the cell. And I'll just do it now. So when a plant is short of nitrogen and it starts extracting it from lower leaves, it has to kill the cell 
and it'll break this down or lyse it and it will pull all the nitrogen out of there because it's after nitrogen, it's after phosphorus, it's after magnesium and it moves all of those out including potassium and potassium is used to move it. So this is really key. So that, uh, this, that energy from ATP runs this cycle and that's what allows us to take and capture CO2. That's the way we get carbon out of the environment. Totally. Plants are important. Life would not exist as we know it. And that cranks it through, and away we go into sucrose, which becomes starch, amino acids, fatty acids, and so on. Now, if you're not freaking out yet, uh, well, you got to know this. <clears throat> this is just the final detail where we get into nutrients. So photosynthesis starts in photosystem two. It was just, photosystem was just discovered first, but it all starts in photosystem too. The first thing that happens and we get oxygen evolution and we break down water. It's the only place that it happens. We break down water and I'll show you how that reaction is. And that hydrogen stays in here and the sun stimulates electrons here and that is carried over to here to something called the cytochrome. And then we have this little thing here called plastocyanin. Well, that's a copper based molecule. We then excite it again with light again in, in, in PS1, and it's transferred, this electron transport system, which makes energy, as ferredoxin, which is an iron compound. And that takes that NADPH I talked about, and it converts it to NADP, or NADP to NADPH, and it produces ATP. The first place the plant produces ATP for energy, and it uses this hydrogen to drive the ATP synthase, which just means it that's what synthesizes it, and it hooks the phosphorus back up with ADP to give you ATP. Just that simple. And this breakdown can started by magnesium, uh, sorry, manganese, calcium, and chloride. And copper is important. Here's uh, chlorophyll, nitrogen, magnesium. Hmm. What do I say when the plant is going to reallocate nutrients from lower leaves to upper leaves? It's going to pull the nitrogen. I said rubisco is the major source, but look at this the chlorophyll, the N. It pulls all the N, the magnesium. So, what do we know about those nutrients that can be remobilized when the plant is deficient? N, P. K and magnesium, all the major nutrients in the cell. And take a look at this. We're just about done, so don't fret it. This is where water is broken down, magnesium calcium cluster with oxygen. So if we don't have manganese there, did I say magnesium? If we don't have manganese there, early and you look at, at, at those uh, deficiencies of manganese early in the growing season, plant can't start. So we're going to be strapped there. Plastocyanin, copper, sulfur, and nitrogen. Uh, ferredoxin, cysteines, a whole pile of sulfur and iron. You almost always have sulfur and iron in the same molecules. So when we're short of sulfur, we got us a serious problem, not just in this molecule, but a whole bunch of other molecules. Uh, sulfur is involved in, in a whole pile of things, which I'll get to later. So it's, it's, it's everything that counts. Deficiencies of any of them are key. For example, in copper alone, about 30 to 40 percent of the copper in the plant is used exclusively in electron transport in mitochondria and in the chloroplast. So if you're short of copper or any of these, if you're short of manganese, your plant is never going to reach its maximum yield capacity. And unfortunately in our climate, our short season, that's hard to do. And photosynthesis makes everything. Carbon dioxide plus water plus light makes sugar and water and oxygen. And out of that, we make everything. That's why it's so important. And the nutrients involved in that are just about everything. And 
it, just about every nutrient we have is in every cell. So we need homeostasis. The plant is trying to do it. Our next challenge, challenge is to look at how the plant tries to do that, along with the genetics. Uh, how about the pipes and how about uh, how it takes in water and nutrients? That's our next webinar. Uh, thank you. And uh, like I said, uh, if you have any questions, you can fire them off to, uh, to us uh, through our tourist website, and we'll try to answer them. Uh, see you in a couple of weeks uh, when we follow through with the, the second part of this uh, series, looking at uh, how